All right, folks, today we're going to talk about money in contrast with bonds. Some of this stuff are things that you have seen before, and some of it is going to be new. So what is money? How do you define money? Once I asked this to students, and one of the students was like, money is everything. Well, no, if you think about it, money is simply a medium of exchange. It's what we use for transactions. Instead of barter, what is barter? A direct exchange of goods and services without an intermediary. So that's barter. So for instance, let's say you are a farmer and you grow wheat and you want apples. You have to find someone who has apples and you exchange your wheat for apples. The problem with that is it's inefficient because it requires a coincidence of wants. So the other side, the apple seller must also want your wheat. Otherwise, the transaction is not going to go through. There are also other inefficiencies like, you know, how do you determine the equivalencies of these things? You need to have like a whole table and a very long list of how, how many units of one thing equals how many units of another thing. Okay, so look at this guy. The farmer has gone to the doctor and wants to pay with a hen or a hog. Right? What if the doctor doesn't want any of those? The solution is, part, uh, is, is money. So if you have bread and you want meat, convert your bread to money first and then use money to buy meat. Right? That works. That's efficient. And money is issued by the central bank, CB, uh, which we're going to talk about more. But pause here and write down your notes. You must have heard of the Bank of Canada, and that's our central bank. It's not the kind of bank where you can have an account with. It's more like a big guy controlling other banks, right? So that's the building in Ottawa, just across the parliament. So it's, it's a bank to the commercial banks and the government. It's the sole money issuing authority. So that the Bank of Canada is the one who is, is the organization which is in charge of printing money. So it's the regulator of the money supply. So MS stands for money supply. It's the regulator of the financial markets. And it keeps monetary policy free from short-term political influences. So it is not accountable to the parliament for its day-to-day -day operations. Right? It is a governmental institution, but so legally speaking, constitutionally speaking, it is governmental. But operationally speaking, for practical purposes, it is independent of the government, all right? The monetary target is set jointly by the central bank and the Department of Finance. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is the idea that why should the central bank be independent of the government in its day-to-day -day operations? Here's the thing. How long is the time horizon or the lifespan of a government? A government usually lives for four or five years, right? That's fairly short term. And because of that, the governments always have an incentive to flood the economy with money so that people are happy and they vote for them again. The problem with that is that it's going to have long-term negative consequences. So it has short-term benefits, but long-term negative consequences. So it's important to have the money in the hands of someone who can see a little bit more long-term and not be influenced by these short-term um, political incentives. Also, you, must, you might have heard of the Fed or the Federal Reserve. That's simply the central bank of the U.S. So in the U.S., it's not called the Bank of America, for instance, or the Bank of U.S. It's called the Federal Reserve. So write these down. In the banking system, other than the Bank of Canada, which is a central bank, we also have these commercial banks. And these are the banks that you're used to. All of you have an account in them. So they accept deposits and make loans. So you can have checking accounts, savings accounts, or if you can want, want to borrow money, you refer to them. Now, do the banks keep all of their deposits in cash? When you deposit your money there, do they keep you, the actual money there? They don't, right? They lend it out. They lend out because they want to make interest. That's the real source of income. And the amount of cash in the reserves is less than 1% of the total deposits. So really, we have a lot of deposits that are that are kind of like on paper or electronic nowadays, not really cash. 
And money supply is the total quantity of money in an economy. So it's all the currency plus the bank deposits, and that includes checking accounts and savings accounts. Now, it's important to keep in mind that money is not the same as cash, okay? Money is what can be easily used to make transactions. That includes currency, but it also includes other forms like checking accounts. So that's the idea of liquidity. So liquidity is an extremely important concept. It basically means the ease of making transactions. Okay, if something is liquid, it means you can use it. You can use it for purchases. Now notice in the picture that the person is using a debit card to make a, to make a purchase. That's also a form of money. So money is a form of wealth that is liquid. So that's the good part but doesn't earn interest. That's the bad part. As opposed to what we call bonds. Bonds is a generic term in economics which includes exactly the opposite of money. You can think of bonds as savings. Basically bonds are forms of wealth that are not liquid, so that's bad, but they earn interest, so that's good. Okay, so the idea is that you always have a trade-off between liquidity and interest. Liquidity is means that it's available, you can use it. Interest means that you can't use it right away, but it earns interest for you. So the opportunity cost of interest is liquidity. That is a very important observation. So highlight it or underline it when you take down your notes. There is a very common misconception among students and others about money. Uh, so I'm going to take the time here to really clarify what is money and how to think about money. Basically, think of wealth. Wealth is the total amount of value that you have, and it can be in different forms. Generally, we divide that into two main forms. There are two main forms of wealth. One of them is called money. The other one is called bonds. Money is what can be used for transactions. That's what we call liquidity. Bonds earn interest. That's the advantage of each of them. A common misconception is that money is good. Forget about that. That's not really the idea here. Money is not the same as good. You can say wealth is good. Yeah, you like to have more wealth. But more wealth can come in many different forms. Do you really want to have it in the form of money? Maybe you want to have it in the form of bonds. Money means liquidity. Money is the opposite of interest. Money is the opposite of bonds. Okay? Now, what are these bonds? Bonds are really IOU papers. Okay? So these are issued by the government or corporations. And it's basically a way of borrowing money. So that's their way of borrowing. They borrow funds by issuing these papers and they pay you interest. So it's a promise to give you back your money in the future upon maturity with some interest. Okay, so effectively you can think of bonds as savings. It's really a form of saving. It earns interest for you. So to wrap up, more money is not the same as more wealth. We like to have more wealth, but we don't necessarily like to have more money because of opportunity cost. There is always opportunity cost to anything that you do, including having more money. More money means more of one form of wealth and less of another form of wealth. So you really want to think about which form you prefer to have. Bonds are interest-paying assets. Money are non-interest-paying assets. Write that down. All right, so we're going to talk about money demand, and that is the total amount of money that the society wants to hold for all purposes. It's how much of their wealth and assets they want to hold in the form of money. It's also called the liquidity preference. So liquidity preference is the same as demand for liquidity. It's the preference for liquidity instead of interest. So the question here is, if by holding money you are sacrificing interest, Remember the opportunity cost? By holding money, you are letting go of interest. So why should you hold money, right? So there are certain reasons for holding money. The most obvious one is transactions. There are certain transactions that we make every day. So we need liquidity for that. Also, there's precaution. 
there are some unexpected expenses that we have so we need to have some money you know for emergencies and there is a speculation so to make financial gains from changes in the price of other assets so here's an example let's say um, in this picture what you see is that the person is buying gold because they're expecting the price of gold to go up so they want to make profit so this is really a business um, transaction a business activity here's another example let's say you have some stocks and you expect the price of your stocks to fall next week what are you going to do you're going to sell them right when you sell your stocks what are, you, what are you doing you're converting your stocks to money so you are converting one asset to another asset so in this case money is just an asset kind of like stocks and you're exchanging it based on what you expect to happen to the price of one of them compared to another so these are the reasons for holding money pause here and take down your notes to make our life easier we're gonna have some graphs and in this case we're gonna have the money market now if you remember whenever you have a market you have supply and demand and you have quantity and price that's the general picture so in this case we're gonna have the quantity of money and the symbol for that is M and sometimes it's QM or just M and we're gonna have the price of money but hang on what is the price of money we use money to buy for other to pay for other things but how can you have a price of money so this really does not make sense all right but the price of money is really the opportunity cost of holding money just like the price of anything else the price of anything else is what you give up to get it now what do you have to give up if you want to hold money remember the dichotomy between money and bonds right so when you hold money you're not earning interest so the opportunity cost of holding money is the interest rate that you're missing all right so instead of p we're gonna have i interest rate which is the equivalent of the price of money if the interest rate goes up people would want to hold less money because they're going to be attracted to bonds instead of money and that's why you have a negative correlation and a downward slope so your money demand curve is going to look like any other demand curve surprise right and the logic here is exactly what you see on the screen based on the interaction of interest and holding money so write this down and draw the diagram yay shifters so when we have analysis of graphs sometimes the graphs shift now in this case it's fairly simple we just have two shifters one of them is y or national income or real gdp um, if GDP goes up the demand for money is going to increase because there will be more transactions just think about it if there is more GDP more GDP means more production so there's going to be more transactions uh, between different sectors in the economy so they need more liquidity to do those transactions the other shifter is the P or the price level so remember that CPI or GDP deflator that's the average price of everything if the average price of everything goes up people need more money because there is uh, not because there's going to be more transactions but for the same number of transactions you're going to need um, more money to to conduct those transactions all right so that's the idea here when you do the graphs the, the rules are the same as before if you have an increase you shift it to the right if you have a decrease you shift it to the left now here i'm going to give you a bonus question so the bonus question is what does this notation mean okay so what you have here is this uh, funny symbol which is really a d a, a curly d um, you have to tell me what this symbol means and what this notation is telling you if you have taken calculus you should be able to figure it out maybe you haven't seen exactly this but you've seen something similar to it if you haven't taken calculus or if you're not sure you can search online or you can come and see me i'll give you a tip so the deadline for this is you send it to me by mayo before next class okay i'm gonna record the bonus questions that you do and add it to your final grade um, or you can do it on paper and bring it to next class but the due date is before next class so pause here and write down you don't have to do the bonus it's just for those of you who are interested 
So we looked at money demand, now we're going to look at money supply. And money supply is even easier than money demand. It's simply determined by the central bank. All right. So we have the money market and the money supply curve is going to be simply a vertical line because it is independent of the interest rate. All right. So for the purpose of this course, we just say that this is determined by the central bank. Commercial banks also can have an impact on the money supply depending on how much they decide to keep in their reserves and how much they decide to lend out. And we had our good old money demand, which gives us a point of equilibrium and an interest rate at the equilibrium. All right, so this is the generic shape of the money market. Now let's look at a, a situation where the central bank increases the money supply. Okay, this is kind of like printing more money. What it means is that the banks will have too much money in their reserves. So they will want to lend out the rest because it's more than what they need and they're interested to make um, more profit on that. Now, how can they motivate the borrowers to borrow? Okay, If you remember, borrowers are motivated by the interest rate and by lower interest rate. So they would have to offer a lower interest rate to attract more borrowers. So the interest rate is going to drop. Yay. People would be less willing to hold bonds because of low interest and more willing to hold money because it's liquid. Right? Remember that uh, trade-off, that opportunity cost? So that's what happens. You draw a new vertical line and call it MS2 and you get a new equilibrium E2 with I2 interest rate and a new level of money. Right? So the graph here really helps us see why the interest rate goes down. You just see it graphically and the logic is also explained to you there. So write down uh, all of the things on the screen, including the graph and the shift. The long run neutrality of money is an extremely important concept. And most of it is things that you've seen before. So first of all, suppose the central bank increases the money supply. This is exactly what we saw in the last slide with the graph. So the money supply curve shifts to the right and the equilibrium interest rate drops. Basically, the idea is that it's easier to borrow. So people have more funds available. Households and firms will desire more spending. So consumption goes up, investment goes up, net exports also go up. So this is a part that you've seen before. And uh, you might want to write this down if you don't remember. The idea is that if the interest rate in Canada is lower, there's going to be an outflow of funds from Canada. So the investors in Canada are going to be motivated and interested in foreign assets. The foreigners are not going to be interested in investing in Canada because the interest rate is low, right? So there's going to be less demand for Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar is going to depreciate. And if our dollar becomes weaker, our exports are going to go up. Our imports are going to go down, so our net exports will increase. Anyway, all of that is going to increase our spending. So aggregate expenditure goes up, aggregate demand goes up, and it shifts to the right. Now, do imagine a, a graph for yourself. If the AD goes up, what happens to GDP and what happens to the price? You can do a rough sketch for yourself. Shift the AD to the right, and you're going to see that the GDP goes up. The price level also goes up. This is what happened. This is the short run analysis that you've seen before. Now for the long run, you have to look at the kind of a gap that's created. So assuming that we start with full employment, because of this increase in GDP, we get an inflationary gap, which means high production. And we, all were, we already know that in the long run, things adjust, right? They go back to the equilibrium. Wow, that's cool. So high production implies scarcity of resources, such as labor. And whenever there is a scarcity of anything, the price of it goes up, right? Scarcity is the same as shortage. So because there is scarcity or shortage of resources like labor, the price of those resources, like wage, would go up. And because of that, the aggregate supply is going to drop and shift to the left. So the producers cannot hire as many workers as before. Now, if the AS goes to the left, what happens to the GDP? And what happens to the price? GDP drops, price goes up. 
So that's the whole long run adjustment process that you know. So the GDP goes up initially, but then goes down and those two cancel out. The price goes up initially and it goes up again. So what is the net effect in the long run? The net effect is only an increase in price because GDP falls back to the original, the potential GDP Y star. Now here's the thing. What if the central bank decides to increase the money supply again? What's going to happen? The whole process is going to repeat itself, right? Initially, there is a drop in the interest rate. People borrow more. There is more spending. GDP goes up. Then it goes back down. And in the whole process, the prices go up. What if the central bank doesn't do anything? If the central bank doesn't do anything, well, we are back at full employment equilibrium. And because we are at equilibrium, things are going to stay as they are. The price stays as it is. The GDP stays as it is. So the idea is that if you see prices going up, you can know what's going on. Who is it back there stimulating this economy? So the changes in the amount of money have no impact on real GDP in the long run, but they only affect the price level. Okay, And that's called inflation. So there's a famous quote by Milton Friedman, my hero, which says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Okay, there's another version of it that says everywhere and always, but that's just a different version of it. So this is really about the cause of inflation. The cause of inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So what is, I really want you to understand what this statement is saying. The, the always and everywhere, you can kind of forget about it. That, that's just for emphasis. The main part of this statement is that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. What does that mean? What it means is that inflation is caused by increases in the money supply, whenever and wherever it may be, right? So he's not saying that inflation exists everywhere. He's not saying that inflation exists always. What he's saying is that if you find inflation anywhere or anytime, the reason for it, the cause for it is printing money. Write that down. The monetary transmission mechanism is about how a change in the demand or supply of money affects aggregate demand and thus GDP. In other words, how we go from the money market to the GDP market. It's really about a graph, two graphs involved, money market and the GDP market. So the first step involved is the impact of a change in money supply or money demand on the interest rate. Okay, this is kind of like what you already saw. If the money supply goes up, you would shift it to the right and you'll see that the equilibrium interest rate drops. If the money supply goes down, it's the opposite, the interest rate goes up. If the money demand goes up, you shift it to the right and you're going to see that the interest rate goes up. And if the money demand goes down, the interest rate is going to drop. All right. You should be able to show these graphically. All right. So in, in all these cases, you should have a graph. Let's see how this graph unfolds. It's kind of cool. So your money market always looks like that when you begin. Right. So the first one, we looked at it already. You already had a we, we already looked at it in, in a previous slide with the money supply going to the right. Um, so that's done. I'm going to show you how the third one works, all right, and you should be able to figure out the other two. So in the third one, the money demand goes to the right. So you shift it to the right, and you get a new equilibrium, E2, and you can see that the interest rate now is higher, okay? So you, graphically, you should be able to, to show what happens to the interest rate because of the given change. So pause here, copy this slide, and copy or, or draw two other diagrams for B and D. The second step of the monetary transmission mechanism is the impact of a change in the interest rate on consumption, investment, and net exports. And this should be old stuff. So if the interest rate goes up, you must think of borrowers and savers. That's really the, the key thing. Whenever you deal with interest rate, remember interest rate is what the borrowers have to pay and what the savers have will, will receive, right? So what would the savers do? Is they gonna, are they going to be happy or not? If the interest rate is higher, 
they're going to have incentive to save more, right? So if they save more, consumption goes down. Remember the disposable income? So if people have, if people are saving more, they have less money available for consumption. What about borrowers? The main borrowers are firms. So investment goes down because the interest rate is higher and they're, they don't like it. That's a cost for, for borrowers. And if the interest rate is higher, there's going to be capital inflows to Canada. Think of investors, uh, financial investors, people living in other countries. If they want to buy bonds, for instance, or stocks, if the interest rate is higher in Canada, they have incentive to buy Canadian assets. So they're going to buy our assets, which means they're going to have to buy our currency. So the Canadian dollar appreciates which means the exchange rate depreciate, the ex this exchange rate goes down, the other currency depreciate. And because of that, our exports go down, our imports go up, right? If the Canadian dollar is stronger, foreigners can buy as much of our goods and services, but we can buy a lot of their goods and services. Both of these result in lower net exports, okay? And then you just have your AE formula, you're going to see that the aggregate expenditure goes down because of all of these. So it's very consistent and the AD goes down and shifts to the left. So you'll draw your GDP market with aggregate supply and aggregate demand and an initial equilibrium with initial level of GDP and price level. So this is just an initial picture that, that you see right now. Then what you do is you say, oh, the AD goes to the left. So let me shift it to the left. And you get a new equilibrium made new levels of GDP and price level, right? So you can see that from Y1 to Y2, the GDP drops. From P1 to P2, the price level also drops. So you get GDP and P going down. Now, if I goes up, if I goes up, we looked at it, if I goes down, what happens, right? So that's the part that you should be able to figure out. Again, think of borrowers and savers, really the same thing, just the opposite way. Um, and you should notice that the most interest sensitive part of the aggregate expenditure is the investment. That's the one that responds the most to interest. Uh, another tip here is that whenever you use this idea of aggregate expenditure, you must write the formula down, okay? So simply write out your formula C plus I plus G plus NX whenever you use it. So pause here, write this down, and also do part B with the entire explanation and a separate graph for it. It's great practice for you.